Yeah, so hello everybody. So um, the afternoon or the last day, so I'm quite happy to see quite a few people still around here. So this is a, a workshop together with Michael and Alexander. We'll talk a little bit about the stuff we are doing in the, well, IoT space, so more, mostly in the things that are doing um, low-power wireless technologies and stuff like that, so not really the things you are used to hear about here. So we have a little bit of an agenda for today, so I will start with a small introduction. Um, then I will go over some slides for um, IPv6 over Bluetooth. I will do the talk here, but the slides are initially done from, from Luis, but he is not able to attend here, so I'm going to stand in for him. So be um, bear with me, because I'm not really into the Bluetooth stuff here, but I will try my best to explain the slides here. After that, we will talk a little bit about uh, Mesh link establishment, that's a specification coming out of the ITF. It's not an RFC, and it's unclear if it ever will be, but that's something that might be needed for, for the things that Alexander will talk about that. And after that, Michael will talk about um, routing this kind of lossy networks that are available where your nodes are moving around and so on. So, yeah. So, first things first. So it feels a bit alien. If I listen to all the other topics I've seen here so far, but all about performance, um, offloading, and stuff like that, data center. So we are coming from a completely different angle here. So um, we try to use this workshop to have a little bit of awareness in what, what we are working on and um, things that we might can work together on, or maybe infrastructure we, we could use from you guys, or something we, we might need to bring to the kernel to support our own needs here. So it's really a little bit of a niche right now, but the IoT stuff is exploding, and it will come back to networking protocols at some point as well. You just need to filter out all the marketing stuff and so on to really bring it down to the, to the interesting bits here. So a lot of the networking protocols that are around in the IoT space are really vendor-specific, so they often don't even use IP, and they just have their own solutions, try to lock the, the customer in, and so on. And what we are trying to do here is ignoring all of this. We really try to focus on specifications that are available in the public so people can just go there, look at them, download them, and try to implement stuff. So most of the things are based on IEEE, IETF, maybe other things, but we really want to avoid all the, um, all the consortiums where you have to go and pay a lot of money to just look at the specification and get them the devices certified. In the end, I mean, if you want to get a um, summary here, it's really bringing IP version 6 all the way down to the sensor. So the subsystems you have currently in the kernel that are kind of related to this are Bluetooth. Um, there's um, work going on for Bluetooth version 6, uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> IP version 6 over Bluetooth. Um, and there's also Bluetooth mesh coming up. I don't really have much details on that because that's still a closed specification by, by the Bluetooth SIG, but I hope that will come out, whatever, this year, next year, or something like that. That could be interesting as well. And then we have the 15.4 subsystem. That's something Alexander and myself are maintaining in the kernel. So that is really short range, low power wireless. Um, has a small MTU size, so you really have to adapt to make sure that you can actually run um, IP over it and stuff like that. So that is what 6 open initially comes, uh, came from, from the 1504 specification. What, what the ITF was trying to do there was trying to bring the normal IP version 6 protocol over this kind of uh, small limited links with, um, in this case, for example, 127 byte of an MTU. So that's the adaptation layer they bring in, and by now they are going for a lot more link layer technologies. I have some slides about that in the end. And then we have um, Ripple as a routing protocol for this kind of um, lossy networks, and then we have the Armstrong implementation from Michael here that is running user space and that is actually trying to make sure that all the nodes find each other and are able to route packets and form kind of, of mesh networks here. Okay. So starting with the um, Bluetooth part. Um, the RFC you can see here that is, was, uh, is the adaptation layer specified for, for Bluetooth to bring IP version 6 over it. It's really close to what uh, the uh, adaptation layer is for 15.4. They have some, some differences here, and that's why we go into the details. So that is the, they have a 48-bit uh, MAC address that is uh, different from what we have in 15.4. So they're splitting up the MAC address to, to build up the um, UE64. 
and they're just splitting up the f uh, first three bytes, then do some padding in between, and then do the last three bytes to putting it all together here. Um, that is basically the, the core point. One part of Bluetooth here is that you keep, have, to have to keep in mind that it's a start topology. Um, that will hopefully change with mesh, but as I said, I don't have much details on that, but at the moment, if you use uh, IPv6 over Bluetooth, it's a start topology. And central, that is, in Bluetooth terms, the, the central element that does all the active scanning and author, uh, authentication, stuff like that. Um, that is kind of the border router in this scenario, and then you have all the smaller nodes, but all of them are g coming back to the, to the central point, to the border router, and doing all the communication over that. So that also means that you don't have any direct connection between the nodes, you don't have any use for the uh, link local addresses or something like that. They all go over the central node and do all the um, communication over that. Yeah, that is basically um, what I said already. So you have, you can use different uh, mechanisms like neighbor advertisement and stuff like that to, to make sure that the addresses are learned from the central node, but it all comes back to the case that they have to go over the central node. And once you have something like mesh and you're able to just do all the hopping from one hop hop to another, um, that might be really a bit more, more tricky for, for Bluetooth to actually handle that, and I expect that there might be an, another RFC coming up for that. And that would mean that there need to be a lot of to be done in the kernel here. So for all the things you can see here, we, the most, of, the most of the things are actually in the mainline kernel. Just recently we've got another five patches to fix some of the corner cases, and um, there is more work to do there, but it's actually um, getting in the right direction by now. One of the things Luis was trying, was wanted to bring up here is um, that he might have a need for a six-low TAN network driver. The way he explained it to me is that all the um, author uh, authorization and all the other link, uh, layer two things Bluetooth has to do in a special way um, might be quite complex to do in, a kernel, in the kernel side. You could do it, obviously, but it might not be the right place or you might not want to maintain it there. And so he was arguing to me that it might be better to um, uh, leave that in the Bluetooth daemon in user space doing all that and then have a um, six-low TAN network driver, which actually can then use all the uh, six-low pan compression techniques we have already in the kernel. That's something that is up for discussion, I think, if you want to do that or not. Um, you just wanted me to bring it up here. So if you have any opinion on that, just let me know if you think it's a wrong idea or if that's a good idea, just, just let me know about it. Um, some other thing that is related to that is that um, not all of the Android and I, um, iOS devices are able to use this um, layer two cap protocol to actually do the, um, uh, do the six low pen stuff over it. So they might have to fall back to the, the get protocol, which is an, a different way in Bluetooth doing it. So they might have to, to do that over the get protocol as well. So but there I'm failing to understand the details because I'm not that much into Bluetooth here. Okay. Yeah, that's just the context stuff. Good, and with that I will hand over to um, Alexander to talk a little bit about the um, MLE experience he was having while developing it. So that one is for the next slide. So, um, hello everybody. My name is Alexander Aring, and I currently work at Pangotronics as a student, and I did my um, final exam about uh, my about a MLE Im implementation for Linux, and uh, I did this uh, at a Hochschule in Main. So, what's MLE? MLE stands for Mesh Link Establishment and it's currently an uh, IATF draft, um, which is for the 6 low pen link layer uh, 802.15.4, so there's no Bluetooth speci specification for, and originally it's developed by um, Zigbee. Zigbee is uh, some vendor specific, uh, vendor, um, some upper layer protocol uh, developed for 802.15.4, and uh, they moved 
the, their stack on six low pan, so they renamed it to six BIP, and MLE was uh, one protocol which uh, de developed there um, at I ITF. It's UDP based, and currently it's marked marked as that in the IETF uh, data tracker. So a Zigbee ID IP doesn't follow to make um, some work anymore on this. And then it's moved to six low working group, but there is no activity. And so far I know it's uh, already dropped. So it's a question of if this uh, protocol will um, will be ever used. But um, it's, it's used in a Zigbee IP, and um, also this uh, SWAT specification, SWAT is um, from this SWAP group, that's from the Nest Labs, which uh, does some home automation, if you ever heard about the Nest Lab, it's now Google, and um, they name it MLE, there's a open source implementation, this SWAT Specification is closed, but there is a open source implementation. It's a little bit very weird. And they name it MLE, but um, I saw some difference uh, between the open sweat implementation and the IETF draft, and it was a little bit funny. Um, I tried to fix it in the open sweat implementation, and then they um, talked to me, it's a fork. And, um, it works a little bit uh, different. And uh, my ne next question was um, on the uh, open thread mailing list. Um, so I know now Emily is a fork um, of a ITF specification. What else is a fork? Um, so maybe they also fork uh, six open, but uh, no, <laughs> they would not do it. But um, I think uh, I didn't look at it, but. Um, I think only uh, MLE is a fork, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit con uh, confusing. So, what does MLE? MLE has uh, three major tasks. That's at first uh, link establishment. So, if you can imagine um, some mesh topology and you want to join this network, uh, you need to um, exchange at first some security parameters for the link layer security uh, suite. And this, yeah, um, the link layer security suite com comes from IEEE, but they have no so solution for um, to exchange the security parameters in their standard, so they moved it uh, to the upper layers, and another uh, link uh, major task is uh, link quality detection. This is how is the link quality to a neighbor good or bad? We need that at least uh, for uh, routing protocols, like what uh, Michael will report about Ripple, and uh, the last. Stuff is a uh, network par parameter distribution in the six low pan. This requires a multicast forwarding mechanism, but um, this was um, a task which I was not interested in because I can change some um, channel or um, address filtering stuff, and uh, I didn't did do that. The the first two uh, tasks was very interesting to solve these issues. Because also the, the first task, because we have currently no um, solution for that. I, I will um, explain it more ab about uh, link establishment. So link establishment, if you have um, uh, 800, 250, 6, 6 low pan, network with MLE enabled, then it, at, at first it blocks all traffic except the MLE traffic until the link establishment to neighbors is done. 
And um, if the, the security parameter exchange is not, I, I al already I talked about that it's not solved by IEEE, but it's not fully correct. It's not it's not solved uh, for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, topology. They have also a start topology, which we doesn't uh, support right now in Linux, and there's it, that's it solved, but um, mostly uh, people use the peer-to-peer -peer topology. And uh, inside this um, security parameter exchange, they have some uh, handshake algorithm with uh, a response and challenge, and some interesting part is also that they move the security suite from the link layer in the upper layer. So they use the same, uh, the same uh, security suite there. The reasons are because Sixlopan is, is, made, is for small, tiny devices which with um, low resource, resources, and uh, they want to sh um, share uh, some implementation about it. So the security parameter which I talk about is, is the frame counter. So all nodes have in their own um, structure uh, access control list with all um, neighbors and uh, they need to be synced because um, if you assume, if you want to join a mesh network and you assume a frame counter of zero, then you trust all um, message which came at first. And it, it's just a frame counter which is always incremented after each transmit. And if there comes a frame, then it will be checked if the frame counter is uh, lower, and um, if that it's true uh, for my neighbor, then um, it will be dropped because the message was already seen on the neighbor, uh, on the um, network. So the, uh, uh, the other task is uh, link quality. So MLE supports to send out a periodic message. They uh, name it uh, advertisement message. And um, you need to know um, if you want to make some link quality measurements, then um, you need to transmit before something. Th that's because you send out periodic message and um, then you get more and more uh, near to the uh, link quality of the neighbor. And um, it's also for bidirectional link quality measurements that's uh, for detecting asymmetric links where, um, from my point of view, uh, to our neighbor, the link quality um, can be measured easily, but uh, in the other direction. If the MLA node wants to know how the link quality is from the MLA neighbor to the node. And this works easily that the MLA neighbor um, put in the periodic message uh, the link quality uh, value of the MLA node, and then the uh, MLA node has the link quality of both direction. So uh, this is because uh, routing protocols like Ripple use uh, bidirectional uh, use bidirect uh, bidirect um, connections between the um, net, uh, nodes. So one of the weird uh, solved issues which uh, has MLA as requirement is to read and select uh, MAC header information on UDP level. So I did a user space implementation and if you create a, a UDP socket, you have no possibility to access 
uh, the MAC header information normally. And, um, but because the reason that the security suite of the link layer is moved into the application layer, uh, they need the, some information from there. And my solution is to put it in the auxiliary data in the control message um, with the system calls workflow message and send message. And uh, there exists al already a socket option for enable this um, attribute uh, IPv6 uh, uh, receive packet info. Uh, it's also defined from uh, IETF um, to get the hop limit and source and destination address. Uh, but I put a simple uh, uh, undercore and L2 for layer two for the Mac. And um, I implemented that this attribute is link layer specific. So you need to first detect uh, what link layer it is. And then in the attribute, it stands um, which um, struct you can um, cast on it. Um, I'm not happy with this solution because I already see issues because if you have two six low pen interfaces into one namespace and you have a connect, uh, I, uh, IP connection from one interface to the another interface, it will not reach the Mac header, uh, not reach the Mac layer. Um, yeah, but we do then, I don't know. Um, I think it's the right solution to make this uh, per auxiliary data because um, the requirements in MLE, it's, uh, it's depending on the MLE message type. And then the user space need to decide um, what MAC header information it will be set. And this is not only an issue in MLA, because um, six low pen does many um, compression, and they will always receive information sometimes um, from the MAC, hair, MAC, MAC in, um, header to reconstruct this information. So my final opinion about uh, MLE. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the link establishment which solved the frame counter issue in the security suite um, it's already a, a solution for that. But um, but when we think about uh, threat and uh, traffic blockation, and it's it's already um, it's incompatible with the IETF draft, um, it will not not work. And um, so m my message is more: if you want to, if you buy a threat-enabled device, and uh, you think uh, it's like so? It's like uh, it's six low pan. Um, I want to connect it with my Linux machine. It, it doesn't work directly because the traffic location and the MLE stuff, which they do there, so they use a lot of open border calls, IEEE 802.15.4, six low pan, and then nothing works because um, MLE in threat need to be handled somehow in the um, application there. So the frame counter issue is solved with the synchronization with all neighbors, but we have a new issue then, because if the frame counter will overflow, then we need a new key. And this requires a key distribution protocol, um, which is yeah, there exists a IEEE 802.15.9 working group, which is working on that. But um, we need, 
we need to look um, which standard will be used outside there. And um, for for thread MLE, I can think about it to to use the open thread implementation. So they have it's written in C++, and they have some MLE instance class, and maybe I can build some wrapper which inner hits from this class and override the, uh, the methods to um, make my own bindings to set up the Linux 6 Lopen and IEEE 802.15.4 stack. So, it, so MLE will run uh, as some daemon in it, inside there. Then maybe it, we can also talk to the sweat devices. And I, I looked at uh, sweat MLE and they doesn't use IPv6 neighbor discovery. They, they combined it somehow with MLE. But I have no, no, um, I didn't look into the spec. If on, the, on the mailing list, they uh, offer me to be a member of the threat group, but um, it's, it costs money and I need uh, to sign an NDA there and then I don't know what I can publish more to the kernel and uh, making uh, open source stuff. And yeah, I also wrote in my exam uh, MLE D sector. I only saw pictures, screenshots about it that uh, Thread, Open Thread has something also, but they didn't release it to Wireshark. So Wireshark D sector is for uh, making the gra graphical analysis. And um, yeah, I, I think I will publish them there too, then we need to uh, look more into the MLE stuff. So that was. I'm gonna use this one, that will work. Um, just quick, so if any questions about any of the things and just they yeah, do we, it in the middle of it so we can switch to the next topic afterwards. So if you have anything, just let us know. Um, hi. <laughs> so my name is Michael Richardson. I, I live in Ottawa, so this is a, not a day trip, but uh, could be. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the routing and, and layer three, uh, layer three to layer two issues and challenges um, in doing some of this stuff. So. Alex has talked a lot about you know MLE things and some of his challenges, and I think he's going to talk again later today about his uh, test bed, right? So that should be actually in very interesting too. And you may have also heard that there's a lot of challenges we have with uh, a variety of industry consortia um, who, uh, like in the XDP space, you know, and all those other things, they want to do their own thing and not tell anyone about it, and then somehow want to put code in the kernels that do things that they won't tell us what it does. So it's across the board, but basically we're trying to bring uh, standards, open standards to uh, the LLN space. So um, a little bit high level stuff. What is an LLN? It's a low power and lossy network. Um, they look, where's the button that makes the laser pointer go? That one, yes. So. Arrangement of nodes in space. They have some circle of radio um, communications. Uh, you can see a big circle here. Um, this number two road node has a here. This slide was stolen from a presentation last week where the guy is upset because for some reason all of these guys have connected to number three and he'd like some of them to connect to number two and he describes a protocol where that could happen. Um, that's not so important. I just thought he had a really good slide with some nice pictures and colors to explain the nice thing. And I'm lazy, so I stole this slide. Um, so, uh, but the important thing is that these, these networks are slow. 250 kilobits per second. That's kilobits, not terabits. <laughs> okay. Some of you who are thinking about that. 
Um, they go down as slow as 9,600 baud, okay? Um, and people are deploying uh, uh, six low pan on things like BACnet, um, which does run at 9,600 baud, and that's multi-drop over 9,600 baud, and the, the, the uh, air conditioning vents up there above our head are probably connected by BACnet. Okay, because buildings don't innovate much and they last for 30 or 50 years and they don't like to run new wiring. And apparently these guys would like to run IPv6 to the, to the vents up there so they can do more intelligent controlling. So they're gonna replace both the, the HVAC and the controller but not the wiring in between. And of course they're gonna do it incrementally. So, um, so that's the kind of, of speeds we're dealing with, and the packet size is over 15.4 as it's defined today, is you have time to transmit 127 bytes. So if you want to transmit 1280 IPv6, you have to have a fragmentation protocol at layer two. And that's what six low pan is, is that mechanism. So, um, Specifications, so typically, as I said, 15.4 is the, one of the specifications from the IEEE. Bluetooth has similar characteristics in 4.x. Uh, BACnet, uh, DECT, if you've ever, if you especially live in Europe and you have a cordless phone, it probably uses DECT. I'm voting on DECT to be the winner because the chips are, are pennies. The bandwidth is much better than 9600. Um, and this pro the specifications are apparently really cheap and easy to implement, and there's lots of chips. But um, industrial places are going with 15.4, and there's good and bad reasons, and there's another, another rev of 15.4 expected next year with a faster PHY, and depending on what time of day you ask the IEEE people, you might get 1,000 bytes per frame size, or you might get 2,000 bytes in that same time, which suddenly be means you don't need a fragmentation uh, protocol. So that's kind of exciting. Still over 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, and the 2.4, it uses essentially one Wi-Fi channel, if you like to think of that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about role. Um, typically a, a network that is used in that space is usually a kind of a collection, a data collection network so you have sensors and actuators and they talk back to a controller. A controller might be in the cloud or it might, it might not. But the, basically what role does is it arranges the nodes in some kind of a directic, directic acyclic tree um, and there's a, routing, a layer three routing relationship between them and there's some kind of backbone. Uh, and I have an implementation of it. Let me see, that button, right. Uh, Ripple. Roll, it's the roll, what is it again? The routing protocol for LLNs, we pronounce it Ripple. Um, and uh, as I said, it forms destination-oriented direct acyclic graph, DODAG. And that's the last time you, we ever expand the acronym again. Well, they're just DODAGs from now on. And the important part is that you can actually have multiple of them. So while I showed one tree, you could actually, if another node in that, in that group wanted to, let me see if I go back, if, if this guy, oop, back, that button, if this guy wanted to receive sensors, he could create a dodag with arrows pointing to him. So you can have many of these, of these trees, and they're basically oriented by where you want to go to. Often the place you want to go to is colon, colon, slash, zero, right? And that's the dodag that, for the internet and that's great. Um, but, and the lighting guys are particular uh, uh, enthusiastic about this, so they created this thing called point-to-point -point RPL, it's usually capitalized, but I screwed that up, and so they create an additional dodag on top of it, which basically connects a light switch to a light bulb through some other, other possibly some other intermediate places. And the light switches are often kinetically powered. So that means that the act of pushing the button down boots a system, a, C, a little microcontroller, okay, produces enough power, it sends a packet, hopefully gets an ACK, and then dies because it runs out of power, <laughs> okay? And, and I kid you not, this is, this is, I keep wanting to try and order them. There's a companies out there selling them, and, and there's companies 
that say they have them, um, but so far I haven't gotten anyone to actually give me one or show me one in, in real life, but um, they, they do exist, and, and I, I, you know, I, I know people who say they've touched them, but I have yet to touch them myself, but I'm still, I'm still hopeful. Um, so just a little bit of difference. So it's reactive. Um, if no packets flow in the forest, um, then nobody cares if the tree is up or down, okay? We don't try to fix the network when nobody needs it. When a, when a, a packet flows and we go, <gasps> I can no longer reach that neighbor, then we repair the network at that point. And the idea is that there's no point in wasting power doing things that for no purpose. And that's in contrast to a bunch of other protocols. So, so Babel, which is in the process of becoming a full ITF specification, not just a, not just a uh, informational draft, um, very popular in community mesh networks. Um, it will be used in HomeNet, which is basically supposed to be plug and play for your grandma. Um, so she can, no, she can now, he or she can now, you know, plug things together and still print at the end of the day. Um, but it's, it, is a, it is a proactive protocol. It re regularly says things, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here, hey, I'm here. And exactly what information is, is exchanged, you know, is different whether it's a distance vector or like OSPF is a basically share the whole database. Wasn't my intention. One of the things you can do because you have all the information is you can do equal path, multi-path, multi equal cost, multi-path. Um, and in Ripple, we can't do that, okay? There are people that building extensions to do this kind of stuff and of course everyone wants to announce it. So a little, too, a little, little more detail. We have two modes in Ripple. One's called storing mode. In storing mode, every, um, every node has routes to all the nodes below it. So, oh, I hate this connector. There we go. So 35 is, has a route to 45 and a route to 55. So it says to get 35 nodes, to get to 55, you go to 45. Okay? And it seems pretty obvious, right? That you say, well, uh, his nose about the adjacency is down. Upwards, he may just have a, a default route. That's enough, okay? So that means that if traffic is going from 51 to 52, you might go up to this guy, which is the common node, and then down to here. If you built peer to P, uh, P2P RPL, you might discover that you could go up to 41 across and down, but that's not in that, this routing tree. So that's storing road. The nice thing about storing mode is you only have to use the network up to the point of the common point. You didn't have to go up to the DAG route, and you realize that these links are quite, can be quite congested because all the traffic that has to go from one end to the other has to go them. And if you're trying to go up to this application server, all the traffic has to go at some point up and down the link. So that's great. The downside is that you need a routing entry at, at some level for every node. So this guy's got at least 56 routing entries. And since we, slow, we basically do slash 128 routes, um, there's, no, there's no compression in general. Um, so that's great. It, it, it's wonderful for machines that have you know, more than a couple kilobytes of RAM. I didn't mention that. Many of the, the low-powered devices um, are way too small to run Linux. So we're talking, in many cases, uh, microcontrollers that have, say, 64 to 96K of ROM and somewhere between 1 and 50K of RAM, depending on the class. And there's an RFC actually where we defined it, tried to define different classes. So generally, we have a class 1 device, which are considered too small to run IPv6 without a lot of really whacked out things to do, and a class 2 device, which probably could run, which is what I described. And most things that Linux would boot on would be what I hope we'll eventually call a class 3 device. And I would call it, I would consider that, you know, our first, you know, uh, open work, four, four megs of flash and, you know, a couple megabytes of RAM, right? That's kind of the minimum for most Linux machines to boot. You don't get a lot with it, um, but that's, that's very rich compared to some of these things. So what does Linux care, why do we care about it? Well, the DAG route is an obvious place where you're going to run Linux. And then the other side that's happening is that as Moore's Law basically means that the minimum uh, cost for these things is going way down, people are saying, why am I screwing with a 
with a $45 microcontroller when I can buy some ARM core or, uh, or, uh, device for $4 and it has megabytes of RAM and my developers don't have to be stupid. But I still have a power budget, right? And I still have radios that are very limited. So that's, that's there. So that's the trend that I see is that, that essentially these little tiny devices are going to get replaced with what we consider as relatively tiny devices in the Linux world, but for, their, for them are very rich. But they still have a very limited power budget, they still sleep a lot, and their networks are still very slow. So uh, non-storing mode. So most of the people that are building big, big networks, like um, industrial plant networks and um, water and gas uh, metering networks, specifically for those two, because if you build an electricity, or in Quebec we call it hydro, which is confusing for those of you who think that means water. Um, <laughs> all the electricity in Quebec is produced by water, pretty much, so that's why it's the hydroelectric company. Um, if you're producing, uh, uh, if you're doing monitoring of your electricity meter, the odds are that you can get some electricity to run your device, at least most of the time, and you may put batteries in it, but if you're collecting data about gas meters or water, then you probably don't have access to power on the next to that brick in your driveway where the device gets placed. Um, so there are networks out there in Canada, in the United States, and Europe that, that are running this right now, collecting gas and meter and other stuff. Some of them are running, actually running V6. Some of them are running the proprietary stuff before they implemented it, but the same hardware is supposed to be upgradable to this and there. So non-storing mode, so I wanted to deal this, so these there. The non-storing mode, you don't have any routes. So what that means is that the traffic goes up, gets to this common parent, but it still goes up to the DAG root because only the DAG root actually knows the topology of the whole tree. The DAG root then basically puts a source route header, okay? And it says go 11, 23, 33, 43, and 53 was being the destination uh, address. It says, here's the list of places to go, go. As you can see, that burns network bandwidth, and therefore power, in exchange for RAM, okay? The advantage about it is that only this guy at the top actually has to have a big routing table, okay? And he has to store it all, but it's a more capable node, and we plugged it in, and all these guys, literally, some of them have one kilobyte of RAM, and they can barely assemble a V6 packet to begin with, right? And so we have discussions about what happens if fragments arrive from, you know, uh, this node and this node up to 23 at the same time, and he's trying to assemble two fragments, and he's only got one buffer, and sometimes the answer is the network throughput go, or goes to zero because it's to keep throwing all the fragments away. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an ongoing discussion of the ITF, exactly how do we want to solve this problem. Um, but, so we have a magic header. Let's see the next slide here. Yeah, so we have this magic header called RH3. It's a uh, source route header of type 3, um, and it contains a list of nodes. So in this case, uh, we're trying to go from, this is from a presentation I did where we're trying to optimize this. Uh, we're trying to go from A down to E, uh, a down, uh, sorry, F to G. We're trying to go F to G, and it's gotten up to B, and now it's going to go down again. So F to G. So that's what this header is there. And we have this route header that has been added by A, and this, this header here is called an RPI, um, RPL parameters index, I think it is. And the R2 means that it's at rank 2. And so we deal with the fact that you might have loops when the network changes by basically knowing if we're going up or down and how far up or down we're going it going. And obviously, if you see an R2 packet on the way up and you are, have a rank greater than two, then it must have looped back around to you somehow. So we do a loop detection by the fact that, so let's say B suddenly started sending packets to D because the topology changed, then this packet that says R2 would arrive at D and D would say, Oh, but I'm at rank three. Why am I getting a packet going upwards with rank two? It must be a loop. And then it would do something to fix it. 
rule in IPv6, which is also sort of an IPv4, but we've never actually enforced it or cared about it, you're not supposed to insert headers in v6. In v4, you can fragment in the middle, but you weren't ever supposed to like insert extension headers in the middle. Um, people did, we never actually had a clear rule. In v6, it's quite adamant. And there's a bit of a war right now going on in the IETF because some people in the terabit networking space would like to insert headers to do essentially MPLS-like things in the middle of the network, and other people say don't. So because of that rule, when the packet got up to A, and we needed to insert this RH3 header, uh, we had to add an IPIP IP header around it. So that sounds, oh, that's sucky. Wow, that's like an extra 40 bytes, 44 bytes, plus this, plus this, plus this. And most of it's empty. So a lot of the work in 6-Lopan is to compress all this stuff. So basically, we say, hey, from a virtual point of view, yes, we have all these headers. Please, ITF, please, do, please don't kill us. But from a practical point of view on the wire, they're all compressed down to about six bytes, right, if you can do it right. And that's, that's, that's neat, and Alex has worked a lot on, on getting that work. So there were some revisions that have happened to how to do it. This was one notion. It was a good doc, good color diagram that I did how to do it. We had some notions of how to do the fragment header, how to move it around. We thought if we could move some of the things above the fragment header, we might be able to forward fragments rather than reassemble them each time. And all these things get compressed, and they get compressed into pretty, pretty small sizes if you can do it right. Some of it is vaguely stateful. I'm just going to go back. Some of it is, some of this, this stuff is, 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 is stateful, but not on a per packet basis. We don't exchange packets in the states. Rather, we have a protocol called 6CO, which basically allows us to um, broadcast some dictionaries to all the nodes. So they have things, for instance, a really good thing is you, you send your 64 bits of your prefix out as a context, and then you can refer to the 64 bits of, you know, 2000 zero colon DB8, blah, blah, blah. You can refer to that as with one byte and decompress it magically to do that kind of thing. So we want, we really, really want, I struggled very hard to find an image of the Spice Girls that I thought was appropriate to put on a slide. <laughs> um, so that's what I wound up with. Um, what I'd really like is I'd really like to add this source route. I'd like to do something like that from user space. Well, I'd like to do it from Netlink, really. Um, and I'd like to be able to list, you know, a series of things. Obviously, I have to implement the RH3 header, um, and I need to put that in there, and I need to make this happen. Um, and so this is the kind of direction. And I, I would sure appreciate feedback, because we haven't even got to the point of, of you know, what exactly we're going to do. Basically, we're, we're at this point, the Linux, Linux works really well in a storing network, and not at all in a non-storing network. Um, we need this for non-storing. So something like this. And you'll notice that we most of the time we probably list the hops by link layer address. Did I remember to make them different? I did, good. Um, and the other thing I'll no note is that one of the things that we do, um, and Alex struggled a great deal with, um, it's in 15.4 we have 64-bit EUIs, um, and we also can have these short two-byte addresses. And the two-byte addresses are generally assigned by uh, it could be DHCP v6, but there are other mechanisms that we're discussing to do this as part of the security enrollment. And the whole point of this is to say, look, if you've got less than 64K nodes, why are you wasting all your time with layer two addresses that have 64 bits, and you've got two of them? Um, assign a two-byte address, and you do that. And then what you do is you then say, take, oh, look, I have this rule in Slack that says if I take my MAC address and I slap an FE, FE80 on it, I have my link local address. And look at how many zeros there are in that I can compress. And furthermore, we have a magic, oh, we have a magic context, a magic context that has an FE80 in it. So actually, we get away in many cases with storing an entire address compressed to about 12 bits. Okay, so that's pretty pretty good. Um, more if it's bigger than 256. So you can see there's some advantages. Um, so that's part of it. The other thing that we need to be able to do is we basically need to be able to set the neighbor table. And we need to be able to modify the power 
Um, so here I'm imagining, I said if you want to go to 12, use this link layer short address of 1234, and here's maybe the, encrypt, the per pair encryption key that I want to use, and I want to set a TX power of 19. I don't know what units they are, I just made up 19. Um, and that's what I would like to use. I'd like to do that, and that's what I'd like the routing table to entry, and then the kernel will take care of that. Um, Alex mentioned uh, MLE as a source of where you do per, per peer keying. So some networks, if you remember, do you remember WEP? Who has configured WEP keys in their Wi-Fi? Yeah, what a pain in the ass, eh? <laughs> um, I'd like to go there again. So, so one model for layer two security for 15.4 is basically WEP. Here is a magic key, Get it, put it on all the nodes magically, and you can encrypt all your packets that way. And in some contexts, such as the time slotted um, TSCH, time slot channel hopping version, um, it's a little bit more sophisticated and there's some other things and you incorporate your frequency into the key and a bunch of other stuff. So the crypto's not bad, even though you have this common key. Um, the other model, which is a little bit more sophisticated, is that in all of the pairs and all the links that I drew, you actually derive a new layer two key for that particular pair. And when you do that, obviously now you need to have a layer two key that is specific to going from point A to point B. Much more secure, but requires a key management protocol to actually go back and forth and do a Diffie-Hellman based upon some authenticated data um, there. So, it would be nice to be able to set all this because, of course, we want to do all this in user space um, there. Furthermore, what I want, uh, I'd like to be able to do the same things on a per packet basis. So, Alex has mentioned L2, packet info L2, and I'd like to be able to know what the, if the receiver can tell me how much power was received, so how, how strong was that signal, how close is that node, because that matters to me. Secondly, I want to be able to transmit with only enough power to re reach the peer that I want to talk to. And it's not just about me being uh, petty and, and, and greedy with my energy, which I obviously should be because I want to survive as long as I can. But if I transmit with too much power, then I pollute the RF spectrum for other nodes. That's probably why Wi-Fi doesn't work well in this room, because as far as I can see, they have too many access points and they're all turned up too high. Right, so basically they're basically screaming at each other and, and that's, a, that's an issue. So you want to be able to transmit with only as much power as you need to transmit. So that's why I want, uh, I need to somehow attach this to the neighbor entry. But when I'm doing probing, because I want to know, Lucas way back there, Lucas is way back there, I have to scream louder at him. And, but I won't, he, he won't hear me, he won't even know if I'm here unless I say it louder. Right? So when I want to figure out if he's nearer or, or further and how much power I need to use, I need to transmit my probe packets with, you know, using some kind of a search algorithm, probably just a simple bisect, you know, start at the middle amount, go higher or lower, he says, I still hear you, I don't hear you, and, that, and eventually I find out what the right power is. And then I have to do this now and then because the nodes could move, they could physically move. One of the classic things that can happen is the door can open, right? Someone comes through that door, all of the lights in this room may suddenly see all the light bulbs in the other room, and that may be good, and they may decide to reassociate, and that's maybe the correct answer, or maybe the door is going to close, and they won't, right? But we have to figure that out. Um, so I mentioned RPL instance ID. So it's possible to create, uh, I think it's 65,000, it's a 16-bit field. Uh, dodags over the network. In many cases, installations run with only a single instance ID. Contiki, until a year ago, for instance, in its Ripple implementation, didn't even put the RPI in, which is great because Linux kernel doesn't even know how to do that either, so we interoperated just great because we were both buggy, right? Um, and, uh, but that's not strictly uh, kosher. Um, and furthermore, the RPI also has the rank information that allows you to remove loops, so you really do need it to send it. Um, so we need to be able to set the inst RPL instance ID. I would like, I don't know if it's the right answer, did I write it in here? 
Yeah, I said I wrote it here. So um, this instance ID, it's a bit like a VLAN tag. Maybe, maybe it could be plopped into the SK buff in the right place and we could pretend it's a VLAN and that would work today, except that the IEEE has added, uh, added Ethernet types to a new spec of 15.4. So in a couple of years, we'll, in theory, be able to run VLANs over 15.4. I don't know why that's useful, but you could do it. Um, so that may be a bad idea. Secondly, um, there's nothing that stops you from running Ripple or any of this stuff over Ethernet, ATM, PPP, any layer two that can support V6. Um, so Bluetooth, um, um, uh, PPP channel over a USB cable between your laptop and your phone. Why not? You could do that. So I'd rather not use a VLAN uh, tag because there may be other things that are going to use it. Uh, I thought maybe Maybe they should just run in separate namespaces? I don't know. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. There was an in-kernel Ripple implementation. What's his name? Joel? Joel? Joel, Joel yeah. Yeah. Uh, Spanish man. Spanish guy. He did a lot of work. Um, he was a bit, a bit miffed because I don't think he understood the culture very much about why no one listened to him. One reason is I think he added at least 30 to 40 bytes to the SK buff. Okay, and I was like, well, I just don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff that you've added, and yet he wasn't entirely wrong to, to say I need something, but he, he wasn't right to do that, and a lot of the stuff he didn't need it there. But uh, anyway, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure it makes sense to put a, a, a route, that routing protocol in the kernel. To me, it does not, um, but I mean, he had a constraint, and I think he's actually deployed his stuff to lamp posts or something like this where it runs somewhere. Um, but anyway, so somewhere we need to be able to record this information, we need to be able to pass it through, and we need to actually be able to select a routing table. So ideally it maps to a routing table, and as far as I know, there's nothing in SK buff that tells you which routing table to use. It's, it's passed through, through arguments down through the, the stack. Um, and so that's what I need to, I need to somehow be able to say, hey, to me it makes sense. You know, I have 64K instance IDs. We have, you have 32 bits of routing table numbers. Um, you know what? You understand that I'm not sure that people feel comfortable with an external device picking which routing table the packet's going to go through. But if the upper 16 bits are set to a known value, then I think that's pretty well firewalled off and you can do the, the right thing. So that's really what I'm looking for because that makes my life easy. I just use routing. I don't have to do anything. I can do my RH3 processing that somewhere. Probably can do it in NetFilter. I'm not sure. Uh, it could be a module. It could be, it could be something else. We really haven't really sat down and done this. Right now, personally, I spend my time trying to get those keys into the security part at a higher level, so we haven't really sat down for the rest part. I think that was last slide anyway. Oh, yeah. Um, if you're interested, I'll just plug a code stand. Um, it's a new ITF effort if you um, are uh, looking to have people implement a protocol that you've defined or you want to implement a protocol that someone else has defined, then it's a kind of a matchmaking service, okay? Uh, it's particularly useful for students and, uh, but you know, anyone can use it, really. You say, hey, it would be really nice if Linux kernel had rapid spanning tree and you don't want to implement it and you put it up and some some kid somewhere says, hey, I like to do that and implement it. Um, so, so Alex and I actually use this as beta testers for it. Um, we have a whole bunch of stuff, uh, new stuff in 6-low RH. So that is a 6-low router header compression. So we basically what we've done is we discovered how bad this IPIP IP situation I showed you earlier was. That was but maybe three years ago. It became obvious how bad it was and that not everyone was implementing according to the spec. And then we asked the question, well, what was the spec? And we realized that we hadn't written it down well enough to argue. So we wrote it down and we said, okay, this is the terrible, terrible number of bytes we need. And then we wrote a spec that said, and this is how you compress them down to almost nothing. Um, so we need an implementation to, to extend that. The hop by hop option, the RH3 processor, and uh, 
Ideally, what we'd like to do is we'd like to run the decompressor and the input path, extract the information that we care about for forwarding, put it somewhere, act on it, and then just forward the packet without recompressing it, okay? Because we don't actually have to take the whole thing apart. We don't have to make space for it at all. Um, we just need to pull the information out, do something, and then pass it through. And as I said, you know, preferably without adding 30 or 40 bytes to the SKB, because that would really be dumb. Um, so while, while the data rates are, are, are low, we'd still like to run it in as few instructions as possible, because we'd like to go back to sleep again. Um, and the other thing I'll mention, I think that's my last slide, right? Yes. Yes, as I thought. The thing I'll mention is that Ripple is being used to build um, what's called the autonomic control plane uh, in a working group in the ITF called Anima. And that is essentially a, an in-band encrypted back, uh, back control channel. And it's not aimed at IoT devices. It's aimed at, at BFRs. So we're basically talking about running Ripple, treating you know, big-ass routers control planes as, as things that we need to manage and running this all. So what that means is that some of this processing may actually show up um, in the fast path of a 100 gig router because these are the packets it has to pull out and hand to the control plane even when the interface is totally screwed up and foobarred and the administrator, the operator would like to get in to do something. So that's an entirely different talk, but just to mention that, that that's the case. So it would actually be nice if we could solve it in as, efficient, in, in as an efficient a way possible um, because uh, it would make it easier to do that kind of stuff in the, in the, in the BFR type equipment. That's it for me. Okay. So do we have any feedback on the requirements uh, Michael has here with the source route and anything? So we have 26 minutes. Yeah, more than enough time, so that's not a problem. Tom, for Mike. I guess he skipped out. So, Michael, can you go back to the first um, slide of your wish list? What do you mean? Uh, what you want. Oh, okay, sorry. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so point number one looks a lot like segment routing to me. Have you looked at that API and whether or not we could... Is that actually upstreamed? Yes. yes. Really? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's really cool work. It has the HMAC and all of that. And somehow this just looks like a, wow, well, a type okay. of segment routing. And segment rating are the people that, by the way, are not supposed to be inserting and deleting headers, but they are. Um, okay. but, but yeah, OK, I'll look exactly at that. That's, I did not know that. And then for number two, um, do you want routes there or neighbors? I need to, it's, it's about neighbors. It's about you are going to this place, so do this thing. Um, so neighbor, yeah, so maybe I, I just type this in, so actually maybe that ad is actually, it should be a MAC address is what I, should it? No, no, no. Okay, Key so off this, is, this is more uh, link specific information. It's link neighbors. specific, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then can you go to the next slide? So what I gathered from this is the general statement of the problem is we have some sort of UDP or datagram packets coming in, and we want to attach some sort of ancillary information to the SK buff, which is device specific, and be able to pass that all the way up to user space through presumably ancillary data. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, and it's either UDP or ICMP. OK, but in either case, it's datagram. We have anything yeah. like that? So just an arbitrary block of something, pass it up to user space with a packet? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Um, so wh who needed it last time? Just because it's not a it's not an un it's not a block that you can't look at. It's it's uh, it so could be well defined. So just like the control block in the SKB, we always have this issue of who owns it at each right. layer. Do you yep. do you, do you release ownership when it, once it get it gets out of your realm? We the control block in the SKB has these issues all over the place. So we start sharing header space, and in Vindaman guys, their stuff breaks, and then it's just going in the other direction. Right. Now my understanding is is 802.11 um, needs this as well. Um, and for the same reason that they need to be able to control the the transmit power to neighbors. Now I believe that a lot of that stays in the kernel, mm -hmm. um, whereas we'd like to get it out of the kernel. Well, here's the other thing. This is sounds like a privileged operation. Oh, it it, it well could be. It, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, a privileged. And maybe operation. that's why we don't see this as a ex already exported API for 802.11 wireless. I mean, the traditional wireless. Because that you could probably do really useful, interesting things to optimize your wireless network if you could mess with the power. Certain demons could mess with the power. I thought that was. I thought those people wanted to do that specifically but for that. Each application doing it is a oh, whole other story. Oh, I see. Yes. Because you got this control message thing. It's like, oh, okay. I don't think it's a. I don't. I think that the. I think that the. The app. That in most cases applications could use make useful uh, information about receiving the information. Mm -hmm. Okay, it would tell them, "Wow, um, is not really any point in trying to retransmit your data because honestly, no one's hearing you." Right. Right. Um, switch but this, to 3G. But I'm, I'm getting back to yeah. the if I know how strong the signal is that I'm getting from node 53, I could adjust my tra my send message right. calls to. But, but as but you where, said, where, who is doing it? Is this a user thing, or is it something in the kernel that's making this this work that way? So, so I'm saying that that the decision to change the thing I think is a user space demon because I think the algorithms are going to be uh, pluggable, complicated, and um, uh, I think probably cause routing changes. When you hear that things are are too weak, you pick a different path. Mm -hmm. And so that's a privileged operation to pick a different path. So that's not a problem that transmit power is privileged, right? But on the other hand, if we only need, okay, routing demons would have to have knowledge about transmit power in order to make rerouting decisions. Yes. However, the power through which we, we should talk to our direct neighbors is a completely ma different matter altogether. So I think yes, there's two, that, di there's two that, different problem spaces. The, 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 it's the same. The, 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 you're right. You're right. It's, the, the, it's, a different, it's a different number, different statistic the routing demon has, because what he cares is to talk to neighbor A or parent A in Ripple. We talk about parents. Talk to parent A requires this many much energy. To talk to parent B requires a different amount. But, right. but when I talk to parent A, I need at least 10 right. and not more. And if that number gets bigger, then I might switch to parent B. Okay. Right. So that switching would be a user space task, but the neighbor layer itself and the physical layer inside all this stuff that's in the kernel already could maybe handle the adjusting the power thing. It could hand. It definitely could live in the in the neighbor. The, certainly, the looking for how much power to, to transmit certainly could live in the kernel. So that means that what I think you're saying is that the 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 setting of the power could happen in the kernel, even if the reporting was to user space. Yes. That's a good compromise. Yes. Yeah, it's part of the next hop, hop stuff. Exactly. Absolutely. A Alex has already done a lot of work putting two byte next uh, neighbors in somehow to the uh, what, what was the what was your block called? Yeah, uh, I did some uh, neighbor discovery uh, callback operation uh, to make additional change in the IPv6 neighbor discovery, and I also use uh, the private data room for uh, a neighbor entry, and I think we can put there some extra in some information um, for specific link uh, attributes, like the short address, which is also the link stuff. And I need to look um, how I can teach it uh, IP route too, but uh, I think this sh should be possible somehow. It, it also occurs to me that maybe what we need is a private interface to that to the six low pan neighbor discovery. Private, I meaning 
it's not shared with applications, it's not received message. It rather is some kind of thing that's, that could be netlink that just basically says, here's the, here's, the, here's the powers that I'm seeing, and then it does the, here's the, it replies with, okay, it does the bisecting or whatever the hysteresis curves it needs to do to do that, to figure it out and keep it stable. It says, this is the power I'd like you to set next time. And so that becomes an input to the neighbor discovery, but we just need to get the output of these are the, this is the power of the packets that I'm hearing um, because if it's probably, it means if you're hearing something with a lot of power, it probably means that uh, you could transmit uh, with a similar power to what's, what's the, the delta. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, PhD students out there that would like to write new algorithms and publish something. Okay. So I have a few more slides just with kind of appendings topics. For, I wasn't sure of how much time we will spend on discussion and so on. So, um, some of the things we might see in the future that might come back to Linux that somehow might be something like low power wide area networks. Um, what they mostly defined are like as it, as a start topology you have. Um, and the routers are connected to a backbone and then are connected together to actually get all these sensors um, talking to each other. Um, some parameters are something like the cell radius you have there is between like three or maybe 10 kilometers. Some vendors actually say it's more, so I think it really depends on the, on the area you're going to deploy them and so on. So examples for that would be things like LoRa and Sigfox. Sigfox is problematic because it's a closed network and you have to actually pay them, and I think even the complete stack is closed. So LoRa is a bit different there. I think the Mac layer is closed, but all the other things on top of that might be something we want to implement on the, on the Linux side, but that's unclear right now. I have to look into that a bit more. But some of the char characteristics are quite interesting here because they're even more restricted in benches in compared to what we described before. So we're talking really about like tens of bytes MTU size, and we are talking about a few hundred bytes per day that can only be sent out by these devices. Some of them are actually only able to receive, or some of them are only able to transmit packets and not doing the other way around, so it's really async as well. Um, and for this kind of thing, they're also starting to define uh, IP version 6 adaptation layers on top of that, and they are looking into different compression schemes because you obviously need them. Something like 6 low pen is not going to work there getting it down to like tens of bytes. And there's something in the, in the making that's called a static context header compression, SCHC. Um, what they really do is like they're having a lot shared context because you have a start topology, you know all the other things, what the small sensor and what kind of state it is right now. And with all this kind of context you have, you can most of the time bring the messages being distributed or the headers being distributed down to a context identifier and then just have a little bit of payload, which is in a machine-to-machine communication could be just a few bytes or something. So that's something that might come up, come up in the future. I just ordered myself a couple of these um, devices, but I haven't been able to really play around with that. And um, some things that might be interesting for us in, in a user space API perspective. So the second point is actually quite moot because that was already discussed here from these things that Michael needs. Um, another thing we have with these uh, six low pan header compressions we have in the kernel, we have no configuration option for that right now. So what we do is we have these kernel modules and once they are loaded, they are applied to the, to the packets and if they are not loaded, they are not, not used at all. So what we are planning on doing is like having a netlink interface for that, but we really need to put a bit more thought into that because it's not simple on off. It could be for some of the header compressions, but it could be also per node basis. For example, there's something called generic header compression, and um, you're not really sure if all the other nodes in the network support that or not, and then you have like the normal hand and neck problem if you get something out, sending the message compressed or not. So you really, um, most of the time you could use something like neighbor discovery to actually have a field in that and telling, okay, I, un um, I understand uh, GHC, you can send me a package with that, but you need to, to have that in a way configurable. So I need to really put a bit of thought into that. And I expect at least that the compression schemes that are, we need to support in the kernel will get a bit more over time if you are going to support different IoT protocols here. So 
the six load pen, what we have right now is, is good, it's working, but we need to make sure that we can actually cater for the future as well here. Um, yeah, some, some missed topics just to finish up here. So that the um, Ripple implementation uh, Michael was referring to was from Jaho Pedro Tavaya. I hopefully uh, pronounced that correctly, most certainly not. Um, he was implementing that and there are some kernel patches out there, but they are based on, I think, 3.18 by now. I tried to get him here to um, talk a little bit about it, but it, it didn't work out in the end. And he seems to be a bit burned out into looking into that. So it seems that there's going nowhere because we have, on the other hand, we have Unstrung, and if you are able to get the user space API that to get all the information out of the kernel, that might be the, the right direction to do that. Um, and then from 6 low, there's a lot of other link layer adaptations in process. Michael mentioned that already. There's things like um, BACnet, there's MSTP, there's DECT uh, Ultra Low Energy, there's Z-Wave, there's even stuff for NFC doing IP uh, version 6 over NFC. That's um, all in the making somehow. Um, it's unclear to me if anything of that is really going to come back into the kernel at some point. NFS, uh, NFC, we have a um, subsystem for that, but for all the other ones, we don't even have support for that. So it's unclear if we have to deal with that at some point or not, but it might come, come up at some point. Yeah, and I also start to try to get some of the groups that are working on the, on the application layer side, um, what kind of interfaces they need to actually understand that a little bit better, um, what they would need from the kernel um, to actually function in a sane way and performant way and so on. So I tried to talk to some of the people there and try to get some feedback, but that is still missing right now. I think that was it. Yep, that's it. So thanks for having us. If you have any more questions, just go ahead. We have like 12 minutes left, so go ahead. I just wanted to add, uh, um, Stefan used the terms uh, uh, root over and mesh under and they may be unclear they're, they're okay, to sorry. some people. So root over is layer three, routing what, root, what I'm doing and Unstrong and Ripple's doing, and, and mesh under is layer two tricks. Okay, so if you remember the XO laptop and their attempt to do mesh networking over 802.16, uh, um, that, was, that was mesh under, and essentially part of the reason why it doesn't work is because we don't get any visibility into layer two. And that's a layer two problem. Um, but that's my opinion that, my opinion is that mesh under is a disaster. And that, that's my opinion. Anyway, because where's trace route? Do you have an ethernet trace route that goes through STP switches? Nobody, it just doesn't exist. And yet, so how do you diagnose it? <laughs> Pardon me? That's right, of course, yes. Okay, so thank you for having us. <laughs>